Hey, Joseph. Did you guys get your insects all collected? Um, yeah, we got them. We still okay. need to. Yeah. Are they vortexed? Uh, yeah, all the ones that we have, they're ready to be taken to the centrifuge. Okay, all right, I'll take care of that. Oh, really? Okay, cool. Yeah. yeah. How are you guys hanging? Pretty good. Tired of online learning? Yeah. Yep. Little... <laughs> yeah. What's on your whiteboard behind you? Um, I'm in the PLC right now, so it's somebody else's stuff. But, oh, okay. Um, looks like a graph of yards versus time or something. I don't know. There's an applied math problem that looks at Usain Bolt's um, world record time in the 100 meters, the one where he was ahead and then he let up at the very end. And it basically plots his acceleration over distance up until the point that he, he kind of started celebrating and slowed down a little bit. And the task is to extrapolate to what he would have been at in terms of world record time if he had run full out for the entire distance rather than than letting up at the end. Sounds cool. Well, I guess I logged on early, didn't I?
Keaton, is that your dorm room? Yes. With red curtains? It's just a blanket hanging over the window. Oh, is it drafty? Yeah, there's basically like a quarter inch gap where I can see the outside. <laughs> uh, dude, can I borrow your blanket from my office? My office is also drafty. I, I resorted today to putting a space heater in my office finally. Do you not have heat yet in your office? Well, I, I do. It just hasn't really warmed up. Part of it is I have three gigantic windows on the exterior wall. So Dr. Dr. Judd's office is much more comfortable than mine. I, I'd go to talk to him about science just to warm up sometimes. <laughs> yeah, I had to, I had to basically, I just duct taped my, like every crack in my window and it actually helped a lot because a lot of bugs were getting in when it was warmer, which was annoying. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, did you call, did you put in a work order through facilities? I did, but they basically told me there's nothing they could do. <laughs> oh, stink. Oh, well. Yeah. Well, go to Dr. Judd's office. It's warm there. Say that again? I said, go to Dr. Judd's office. It's warm there. I, I had to put a space mm -hmm. heater in my office today, finally. Yeah, the heat has been creeping up in my office for days now as they've gotten everything started up. Yeah. I kind of wish I had a window, actually. But no, you don't. No, you no. don't. <laughs> All right. Keaton was telling me he's got a he's got a quarter inch crack at the base of his window that oh, no. that evidently can't be fixed. So. Oh my gosh. Okay, let's see. Good. All right, we can go ahead and get started. I think. It's 1231. Now I can see you all. Okay. All right, welcome. Today we're going to be getting into this um, topic of measuring biological diversity, or at least ways that we can quantify biological diversity so that we can make comparisons. And we're going to um, use some of the same, we're going to talk about some of the same methods that Vina all use in their study on Concept Prairie. So you should have all had a chance to um, complete your measuring diversity preparation homework that I posted yesterday afternoon, or excuse me, Monday afternoon. Um, so we will we'll talk about that in just a few minutes. Yeah. Nathan, are you going to do the uh, required reading? before you get started? Or are you gonna do that at the end? Um, I actually just seem to have closed my Prairie Organisms of the Day thing. So I'm, that's why I'm pausing here. Ah. Um, uh, the required reading. Um, can you- Or you want me to do it while you while pull I, your stuff you, up? Yeah, can you do that while I pull this up? Yeah, let me, I have to go pick it up again. Uh, let's see. Why did this close so on? the provost and the faculty council asked us to read a statement to you guys. Um, I suspect all of you have already heard it, but I'm going to go through it anyway. It's about COVID stuff. Uh, this is a message from the faculty of William Jewell College to the students in all our classes. First of all, we want to say thank you for your efforts in keeping the campus safe and open during the fall semester so far. Your work in this regard and your willingness to deal with frustrations and annoyance of COVID-19 mitigation measures is appreciated. As we move into the winter season where respected scientists tell us that there is a strong possibility of increased risk and community spread of COVID, we want to take a moment to encourage you to continue the good work you have done, uh, been doing uh, to limit the spread of this virus while we are all feeling the inevitable fatigue that results from being constantly diligent with regard to safety protocols it is imperative that we not let our guard down and become lax in our standards where safety is concerned. Over the next few days, there will be a series of communications to remind us all of our responsibilities with regard to community safety, offering more details about the period of time after Thanksgiving break and beginning to outline our plans for the spring semester. Please keep an eye on your email and be sure to read carefully any information that is sent to you. 
As always, ask questions if you have them. We want everyone to be as informed and able to participate safely as we can in our learning community. We on the faculty join you in hoping that in the spring we will begin to see the end of this pandemic. In the meantime, for all our sakes, we ask that you continue to wear a mask, keep socially distanced, limit time in close proximity, and practice good hygiene, especially by frequently washing hands with soap and water for at least 20 seconds, and consider getting your flu shot. Uh, thank you again for the good work you've been doing to keep us all safe. And that is the thing that we were asked to read to you. And I just wanna say that I've been pleasantly surprised at how little um, community spread we have seen on campus this fall. Um, I was actually expecting things to go far worse than they have. And I'm really happy about that. Never been so glad to be so wrong. Um, do you guys have any questions about anything? Dr. Judd and I, don't really know what the plan for spring is because they haven't told us either. So I'm assuming that we'll find out when you do. And uh, we're eager to figure out what's going on with spring as you are because we, we also have to make plans. Do you guys have any questions about anything about college, COVID, the interaction of the two, et cetera? Does it just feel like the new reality? All right. Well, if you do have questions, you know, feel free to, to voice them and you can voice them either in class or you can drop us an email and we'll do whatever we can to, to clarify things for you. Or just serve as a source to vent. I'm done, Nathan. Okay. So if not, then um, I don't know what happened to my little three slide set that I made. I just put up kind of for the prayer organisms to find the ones that I was going to talk about anyway. Oh, who were you going to do? I was going to do the lead plant that we hinted at last time and the prairie chicken. And then I forget what my four was actually. Um, so I'll just pick one of these. I mean, what my, what my grass was, I don't remember. Um, Maybe we'll do a little blue stem. That'll be good. Okay. So you've got them there because I have a whole a whole slide show of just prairie organisms. Yeah, I accessed that same slideshow. Okay. All right. Cool. All right. Awesome. Then you don't need me. Okay. So let's do our prairie organisms of the, of the day. Um, in in prairies across North America, there are really three families of plants that comprise most of the species that you see out there. The most obvious one is probably grasses because we're talking about grasslands. They are not only rich in terms of the number of species, uh, but they're also rich in terms of, they're also uh, abundant. They're very common on the landscape. If you were to add up all total area of all the leaves of the plants in the grasslands, grasses would make up most of that. Um, the next group in that sort of top three are the sunflower family, the Asteraceae. And then the third member of that group is the legume family. So this is an example of, the, of what we call lead plant, Amorpha canescens, in the Fabaceae. Sometimes you'll see Fabaceae written as an alternative called the leguminosae, which is an old word for the bean family. But now you can tell that plant family always end in Aceae, except in a few cases where people like to use the old word like leguminosae, but fab, Fab AC, fabulous beans. You can always remember that family name. Um, one way that you can usually recognize beans is their distinctive leaves. So notice these almost feather-like compound leaves with many leaflets. And then lead plant has these really nice purple inflorescences with pickled bean flowers arranged along each of these spikes. Legumes, one of the things that's important to know about legumes is many of them, especially in the prairies, are nitrogen fixers. That means they form mutualistic relationships in the soil with, um, with nitrogen fixing microorganisms. These organisms can convert atmospheric nitrogen into biologically available nitrogen. And we'll talk about that. We do nutrient cycling. Um, so these things not only provide their own or bring their own source of nitrogen with them as they establish those soil relationships, but they also make nitrogen available to other plants as they decompose and as they relate with those um, soil microorganisms. 
they are deciduous as with most plants in the prairie. They senesce at the end of the year, they'll lose these leaves um, and those will either become fuel for, for burning or there'll be uh, leaf litter that decomposes and reintroduces some of that nitrogen into the soil, making it available for other organisms as the leaves are broken down. Um, it's adapted to bright light conditions. So notice that kind of, uh, kind of whitish or almost bluish white color to the leaves. Those, that hairiness or that pubescence that we talk about um, on the leaves is one of that, their adaptations to withstanding bright, um, high sun conditions. And they're really distinctive. You can feel the fuzz and recognize that kind of bluish or glaucous color um, when you're out in the field. Um, Paul, I know you like lead plant. Is there anything else you want to say about this one? Uh, I have five of these growing in my yard. Nice. <laughs> see here. Um, and oh, you know what? I was going to do a C3 grass, I think. Um, yeah, this was the one. So this is an, a grass. So I told you about one of the top three most common families is the Fabaceae, the Asteraceae, and the Poaceae. This is Poaceae, the grass family. Um, and Calaria is one of many kinds of grasses that we call um, bunch grasses, or they're clump forming grasses. So you'll see a bunch of stems and leaves all coming out of one little bunch in the ground. Um, call that clump forming. Um, the common name for this one is the prairie june grass. It's a C3 grass. Um, they tend to be the most productive early in the season, early in the growing season, when there's plenty of water available and it's not too hot, right? So early um, spring and early summer. And then as the year progresses, they'll switch to, um, to a flowering. So you can see these flowering grass spikes here. Um, and all the little sort of the texture that you see there are the anthers, the pollen producing organs of the plant sticking out of the, of the inflorescence. So even though they do well in that um, cool early season, they're also drought tolerant, but they're not very productive during droughts. They kind of shut down and, and tolerate that, those dry conditions. And then are most productive when it's nice and wet and not too hot because they're a C3 grass. And we'll talk about that in another one or two lectures. And let's see, come on. Well, we can go here. Okay, and so a prairie animal. I don't think we've done a bird yet. Um, this is the Western Meadowlark. This is a, a ground nesting bird. So it lives in the prairie and um, it makes nests among the grasses and forbs uh, low to the ground. Um, and let's see, what else do they have here? They're found throughout the, the West. So you can see basically the transition to prairie and more open habitats as soon as you get here and all the way to California, all the way to the coast, they're found in, in grassland and dryland habitats. They're in the same family as the blackbirds. Um, they, um, let's see, John James Audubon gave the Western Meadowlark its scientific name. So we, um, sometimes you'll see the, uh, the authority listed here. We should put Audubon here. Maybe you've heard of Audubon, who's also the namesake of the Audubon Society. Um, and it's Sternella neglecta, which means starling-like. Um, and he claimed that most explorers and settlers who ventured to the west of the Mississippi after Lewis Clark over to this common bird. Um, but it is it is pretty common, even though um, Audubon thought that maybe people weren't talking about it as much because it's a striking and attractive bird, right? This big yellow uh, feathers or the yellow breast. Um, they're noted for a feeding behavior called gaping, which relies on using their um, beaks muscles to open their bill. And then they insert the bill into the soil or bark and then forced open to create a hole. And then they can dig in that hole for um, insects and grubs and other food items that many other birds might not be able to reach. So notice that big strong beak they have for digging around in bark and in soil to get at insects. Um, it also happens to be the state bird of Kansas.
All right. Transition here. I had mentally prepared for another animal, but we will catch one next time. What is this? Measuring diversity. Okay. So we started to get at some of these ideas, um, but we're gonna return to the learning objectives once again. I want you guys to be able to define some terms in community ecology. Some of those were on that prep homework and others we've already introduced in previous lectures. So we're gonna hit on them again. Um, we want you to understand the relationship between sampling or sampled area and species richness um, and biodiversity and understand why the relationship looks the way it does. Um, you should be able to both create, sketch, or draw um, figures that show the relative abundance of different organisms, but you should also be able to read those diagrams. So if you can create them, you should be in good shape. Uh, and then we're gonna talk about the effects of bison on plant species richness and why the effects are what they are. So this will relate directly to the V et al study, especially that last point. Um, I think last time I closed by talking about the definition of biological diversity, and how the sort of broad general definition that you'll often see in textbooks is that it is the totality of the genetic, phenotypic, and ecological variation among living organisms. But in ecology, especially community ecology, it often refers to things like the species richness, the relative abundance of those species in the community, the composition of the communities, in fact, which which exact species are there, not just how many. And then also sometimes we talk about functional diversity, which is getting more attention in the literature now. So certain kinds of species perform similar functions in a community. So the number of different kinds of, of functional groups can be important for um, assessing biological diversity. If you have several grazers, they're all doing the same thing, eating the same kinds of plants. Whereas if you have different organisms that specialize in different kinds of plants, then maybe you have more functional diversity, for example. But let's um, start by asking this question. What is a biological community? Um, who out there can help me come up with a good definition for a biological community without maybe looking ahead on the, on the slides? What do you think of when you think of a biological community? And I have an example of one on the screen. Maybe we can maybe we can work into it. Uh, what what am I usually talking about if I talk about a population of organisms? This one's a review. Isn't it just like a, like an area, like a general area where um, animals can like coexist in the same like ecosystem or habitat? Are you saying that for community or for population? Oh, uh, population, yeah. Yeah, so if you're saying it for population, just be sure to specify that you're talking about one species at a time. But the other components that you said are all correct, a general area, um, some organisms, maybe you said animals, but of course we have plants as well. Um, a, a group of organisms of the same species living in a general area. And what about ecosystem? What do you guys think of when you think of an ecosystem? I just have a partial answer that's okay. We can work together to put one together. And it'd be like all of the plants and animals that like live in an area together, like everything that, and like, I guess all of like 
the microorganisms and stuff that work together to like make it work. Anyways. Plants, animals, microorganisms. Since I asked about ecosystem, I like how you said, Katie, I like how you said make it work. What, what do you mean by that? Um, kind of like how they all kind of like have different things that they do to help each other live and survive. And like they can either like feed off each other or it's like, I don't know, microorganisms like give different nutrients for plants and stuff like that. Yeah, okay. So it sounds like you're describing the interactions between the different species. Um, which is good. And that's actually where we're going to end up with in, in a community. Um, with an ecosystem, we're usually also talking about um, the flow of energy and nutrients within and through the system. So when we talked about um, the flow of nutrients out of Hubbard Brook in class the other day, that's kind of an ecosystem level process. But when we think about a community, we're thinking about all the organisms, whichever population they happen to belong to, in a given area, which you said, um, and their interactions. So in this shot, we have, uh, you can see the bison, you can see some of uh, the, probably a cottonwood tree maybe, um, several different forbs as well as grasses that, where the bison are, are um, laying down, shrubs forming these patches across the landscape. Um, so you really are seeing many, many different species. Was that a question? No. Okay. Um, so you really are seeing many different populations of various species all in a given area. In this case, the area is the area of the photograph, um, or Kanza Prairie. So this is the definition that you'll often find. I've provided quotations around it. Um, a group of populations interacting either directly or indirectly within a given area. So that definition has several key components that we should be able to break down and discuss. For example, what do we mean by a population, which uh, Daniel already told us about. Uh, there's this question of a given area. Um, if I were to ask you about the boundaries of the Kanza Prairie community or um, grassland community, what might you think of as, as suitable boundaries for a community? like an individual watershed? So that's a good answer. In the, in the way we've presented things so far, the researchers have defined these areas based on watersheds. And that's a physical boundary that, that does separate things hydrologically. But do you think that um, in the absence of fences, the bison members, uh, bison members of these various communities would, would care one way or the other about which watershed they're in? Probably not, right? But, but certain organisms that um, don't travel very far might actually reside mostly within a given watershed. So the boundary for one species and the boundary for another might, might not be similar, right? Different organisms are gonna be limited in their distributions by different reasons or for different reasons. There's a classic paper called The Lake as a Microcosm. It's a foundational paper in ecology and this, um, in this paper, the author talks about the lake as being a good way to understand all the interactions in a local area of a community, because the boundaries of that community are very well defined. It's the edge of a lake. Um, but in fact, are lakes isolated completely from the surrounding landscape? Yeah, I see some heads shaking. How might a lake not be isolated? All the fish and invertebrates swimming in the lake, how are they not isolated from the surrounding rivers and, and land and neighboring lakes? Well, like when it rains, everything from the soil and the dirt and stuff washes into the river. So they're not isolated from that. Yeah, so you get nutrient and sediment input from, from washing in. Um, are there members of the of a lake community that you can think of that might move between different lakes? 
like ducks and geese and turtles. Yeah, and they can they might be interacting with the fish or other organisms that are living in there and they might transport aquatic plants. So when we talk about a given area, what I want to stress here is that you can try to find natural boundaries to a community, um, but know that they're fuzzy. And in general, um, we have to define these boundaries operationally. We have to justify some decision for saying, cons of prairie, the community is going to be bounded by the land they own, or just this area where we call the Flint Hills, where there was no, um, no tilling for, by farmers in the past, right? So those are operational definitions that probably don't matter to the Western meadowlark. Nathan, can I now interject got, something? Yeah. Yeah, if you guys go back to the, the introduction where we showed you the map of the watersheds, all those watersheds that are labeled in to indicate that they are native grazers, those watersheds don't have any fences separating them. So bison are free to roam in any of those watersheds. Now around all that area where there is an all that area where there are inns indicating that those are watersheds with native grazers, there's a fence that then keeps them out of those other watersheds, but they're free to roam any, any space within there. And actually after you burn one of those watersheds in that native grazer area, as the new grass grows up, um, the bison will actually go and they'll just hang out in that area where there's new grass coming, coming in and they'll eat that. And I mentioned in the chat, um, some time ago uh, about um, Native Americans actually used to burn sections of the prairie in order to attract bison herds to them rather than chasing down the bison herds. And so this is a, a well-known behavior of bison. So they can, they can go anywhere within there. Yeah. Okay, and then I have um, these two points, direct interactions and indirect interactions. Um, Direct interactions are the kinds of things we've been talking about, like uh, competition for a shared resource, whether that's nitrogen or, um, or light or something else. But you can also have indirect interactions, uh, which are just interactions between organisms that are affected by uh, or that are, that are driven by um, shared interactions. So bison might, um, for example, graze on one group of one type of plant when it's uh, when it's abundant or just after a fire and not graze as much on um, or and, and pick other plants in an, in an area that hasn't been um, burned for quite some time. And those, the, the different influence of bison herbivory on different plants that maybe aren't necessarily competing because they're not in the same spot, they're not neighbors, um, can, um, can result. So bison might suppress um, plants in different ways to produce indirect interactions. A good example of an indirect interaction is what we call a trophic cascade, where there might be some herbivore, say a bunny rabbit or a species of rabbit that eats certain plants, but then there might also be uh, raptors, birds that eat those rabbits. If there's a lot of raptors, they'll keep the, uh, the population of rabbits down and the plants do better. Uh, conversely, if there's not as many raptors, then the rabbits do better than not being eaten by the birds, and so they suppress the plant population. Now the raptor and the plant aren't interacting, but they are interacting indirectly via the rabbit as a prey item and as an herbivore. So that's an example of an indirect interaction. Um, there's some related terms here that I want to um, at least expose you to so that you can um, separate them out or break them down when you see them. Uh, we're talking right now about communities, and I think it was Katie said, all the plants and animals and microorganisms will include in their fungi in a given area. But sometimes you'll see scientists talk about uh, assemblages as opposed to a community. And when we talk about an assemblage, it might be just the plant community or just the herbivore community. Um, well, actually the herbivore maybe is not a good example, but the, all the plants are related to each other because they are plants. So the plant community might be better termed an assemblage. Um, a guild refers to a group of organisms that all use similar resources. So this might be the herbivores in, an air, in a community would be the local guild. Um, so you'll see each of these, there's also ensemble, but I rarely see that in the literature. 
Um, and they're all kind of interconnected, but they're sort of subsets of each other. So guild is organisms that use similar resources. A clade is organisms that are all related to each other closely. And the community is all the organisms in the area. And sometimes you'll have some overlap between those terms. Okay. Now I'd like you to take out your, uh, your preparation homework. Oops. Here we go. Stop share. And I'd like to go over some of those, some of the questions that were on there. Who can help me understand what species richness is? Gallery view here so I can see you all. Who found a good clear definition for species richness? The number of species in a given area. Good. Yeah. Yeah, the number of species. Good. Um, that's a little more precise than saying species diversity because diversity often includes the next term. Someone else tell me about relative abundance. It's proportional representation of a species in a community or sample of a community. Good, and what do we mean by proportion there? Mathematically, what, is, what does proportion mean? Just so we're all clear. Like what, Chris? Um, you go first, Michaela. Uh, I said like equal amounts, things are proportional. Um, so these don't necessarily have to be um, equal when we're dealing with proportions, right? You can have more or less of some total. So we've got this, we've got species on the one hand, but then what are we using to calculate proportions? It's not just species, there's something else about, about these organisms. How do you measure the proportion of different species in an environment or in a community? And someone else can chime in. Joe, did you want to help? <laughs> there's a few possible correct answers here, but there's one that's pretty intuitive. What, what do we mean by abundance? Like the frequency. Frequency, Katie, what were you gonna say? I was gonna say it's like the amount of animals that are or like plants or something that are in one species relative to how many there are like total throughout all of the species. Good, so a count of individuals is what we mean by the abundance. So when we talk about relative abundance, um, Sydney, do you wanna help me understand uh, relative abundance? If abundance is the number of individuals? So would be like the proportion, like the number of one in like one species to like the number of the rest in the community. Yeah, good. So we count up all the individuals in each species. We also figure out what the total number of individuals counted is, and then you get a proportion for each species, proportion of individuals for each species. You can also do this with other metrics. For plants, we often use cover or leaf area because that's what matters for fixing carbon out of the atmosphere through, through photosynthesis. Um, but generally, we, we're talking about number of individuals. What about evenness? Brandon, did you get a definition for species evenness? Uh, is that how close species are to each other in a given area? What do you mean by close? Um, just... Uh, Maybe like how many are in the area or just like if they're close together, the distance is big or whatever. So it doesn't actually mean the proximity of different species to each other, but there is a way that you might, you might 
read the word close. Anyone want to help out? Anyone else want to help out with that one? What is evenness? I said a measure of distribution of individuals among total species occupying a given area. So that sounds pretty close to relative abundance again. And evenness is, um, is closely related to that. But let me ask a different way. Uh, what would be, what would a maximally even community look like? Like all, all species are equally abundant. Yeah, good. So evenness refers to um, how similar organisms are in their relative abundance across a community. And then we come to community diversity. What do, we, what do we mean by diversity now? If we've got this term species richness, we've got this term relative abundance. One, two, three, four, five. Small class today, huh? Um, I couldn't find a super clear definition for this in the book, but I said the level of species evenness in a community. I don't know if that's right. Yeah, so the, the evenness of a community is one important component of community diversity. And what's another component of community diversity? Probably like abundance. Well, those two things are going to be sort of inversely okay. related, right? They're al it's almost the same thing. But you could have two communities with very different evenness or, or with, with, um, with very similar evenness, but they could be different in another way. What would that other way be? It's one of the early, it's the first term. It's their richness. I see some nods and stuff. So community diversity is going to be a mixture of abundance or evenness um, of species in the community and the number of species in the community. Both of those things can vary. And then what about a rank abundance diagram? Who got a good definition for that? You might have had to just look at a diagram and come up with your own definition. I put lots of the relative abundance of each species against rank defined as the order of species from the most to least abundant. Good thing, Connor. That's a good one. So important point there is that the species are ordered or ranked from most abundant to least abundant. Um, I've seen people create or I've seen students create a rank abundance diagram. They get the abundances, they calculate relative abundance from the number of individuals, but then they just don't rank it. And so you get you, you don't get that the nice smooth shape that we associate with a rank abundance diagram, which looks one, two, three, four, five species. The first species is the most abundant. If you're doing relative abundance, it varies from zero to one instead of zero to 435 plants or whatever. So that's going to have some abundance, some proportion in the community. The next one is a little bit less abundant. The next one is less abundant and so forth. If you don't have them ranked in order, then it'll go up and down all over the place. But generally we see this pattern of a decreasing curve as you go from more abundant to less abundant. And the slope of this curve is evenness. Okay. So then we had a question here about species richness with bison and without bison, bison present and bison absent. Um, did you guys, who here felt you had enough, or maybe let's talk about this C. Did you feel like you had enough information to characterize the species richness for each watershed? We had these different watersheds and 10 and 11 and 14 and 16 and so forth. Some of them with bison, some of them out. Did you feel like you had a good sense of species, the watershed? 
species richness within each watershed. I mean, I felt like I could make a decent estimate, but I don't know, probably not. Could you estimate the, the average richness of a watershed with bison and without? Yeah. So did anyone, did anyone calculate the average species richness of the two scenarios, bison absent and bison present? Yeah, I, I did the averages. What did you get for your averages? I got 46.7 on bison absent. And then I got 58.5 on bison grazed. Did anyone try comparing those means statistically? Anyone else? Well, I didn't calculate it, but I did look at the, I like estimated what the standard deviation would be. And the standard deviation of the bison present is gonna be a lot higher than bison absent. Yeah, good. So if you calculate standard deviation, you could also calculate confidence intervals around those, um, those averages. And what you'll find is exactly what Daniel was saying was that it's much larger. The distribution is much, is much wider for the um, bison present situation. When you are comparing two distributions um, and you're using something like a t-test, um, you might need, or just plotting confidence intervals, one of the assumptions behind some of these methods is that the variance in your two samples is similar. But that's probably not the case here. And you can actually test called the Levine test for homogeneity of variance. And these two um, sets of, these two data sets have very different variances around their average species richness. So that's one aspect of this. But the other thing that makes it difficult to, um, to draw a lot of conclusions here is, as you, you may be starting to realize, species richness is sort of a crude of diversity. Um, it doesn't tell you anything about how common the different species are in each of these um, two, two subsets with and without bison. If there are some species that are really abundant and most are very rare in one scenario, and then even evenness is, is uh, pretty similar across all species in the other scenario, that's totally missing from any metric that uses only species richness. So let's go back to the, um, the slides here and talk about that maybe with a little more of a visual aid. Okay, so here are those, the three um, main metrics that we've talked about, species richness, the relative abundance or the proportion of individuals in a community and evenness, a measure of how equally individuals are distributed among the different species in a community. These three things are close related to each other. And if you only have one, maybe you can make guesses about some of the others, but it's, it's really best to have all three of these. If you only have these rich, you don't know how equally individuals are distributed among other species in a community. Let's do a visual example. Which community here, A or B, has higher species richness? And you can just apply the morphological species concept here in this case. Uh, let me, yeah, here we go. Community A. Higher species richness, why do you say that? Because there's more of a variety. I think what you're keying in on, Tessa, is actually higher diversity, higher evenness. There's you know about three of each species. But remember, richness is just how many species are present. They have the same species richness? Yeah, good. Good, Connor. They have the same species richness. So you two, Tessa and Connor, have really illustrated an important aspect of understanding community diversity. It's a combination of richness and evenness. And our eyes are pretty good 
at, um, at picking out diversity in terms of evenness initially. Um, the inverse of evenness is dominance. So community B is dominated by this grass, this little bunch grass, and the other species are rare, represented by only one or two individuals. Um, and we can quantify that using proportions, right? If you count up how many individuals there are, and then the number of individuals in each, um, in each species, the grass in this case makes up eight out of 12 or 66% of the um, community, whereas in this case, the grass makes up a quarter, 0.25 of the community. And of course, this gets a little more complicated when you're dealing with dozens of species. So we kind of went through that already. It's the point we just made. All right, so the nice thing about species richness is it's easy to interpret and it's pretty easy to get um, get a sense of species richness if you're not too worried about uh, rare species. It's pretty easy to, for scientists to communicate species richness to policymakers or someone who maybe needs to know something about a community but maybe isn't a biologist. Um, but it's really only a partial look at the system. Um, so how do we measure species richness? Well, we need a sampling strategy because we can't always sample all of the, the species in a community. And it's hard to know when you've gotten close to that. So we use samples. And for, for vegetation sampling, we often use quadrats where you create these small plots in your community and you sample all the individuals in a quadrat. Then you have a measure of individuals and the proportions by which they're uh, apportioned into each of the species that you've detected. So some number of individuals, some number of species. You, can, you don't have to use quadrats though. You can also create a transect and walk along the transect and count species. Some of you have experience with transects now um, when you were sampling goldenrods, but every time you encounter an individual, you have to re record what species it belongs to along your transect. And there's also point intercept methods. You can just drop points onto the community and if they land on or next to an individual, you just record that individual and what species it belongs to. That's what they've done in Kanza. You can start to get a sense of the relationship between total area sampled if you add up the area of all your quadrats and the total richness that you measure. So in this case, we've got 30 um, quadrats across a whole watershed here. And we can look at the accumulation of species, how high that number gets as you examine each one of these quadrats. What do you guys think the relationship is gonna be between area sampled and number of species detected? Probably the bigger the area, the more species detected. Yeah, that's one of the simplest um, patterns in all of biology. It really holds up in almost every system. And one way that we can, we can illustrate that is with a species accumulation curve. If you have some number of samples like quadrats or some number of individuals that you encounter in a community and you record what species they belong to, the more quadrats you have or the more individuals you encounter, the more species you, you accumulate. But notice that while it is a positive relationship, it generally has this kind of um, this arced shape to it where you're approaching some sort of a maximum where before you sample everything, before you sample all individuals and the entire area of a community, you've encountered almost all of the species that are present. And when you um, do a randomization test of, of all the species you found in the order in which you found them, you can get these smoothed curves called rarefaction curves that are based on the raw data, which is this stair-step pattern of species accumulation. So every time you look at a new quadrat, you say, do I have all the same species as before or did I find some new ones? Well, maybe I found two new ones. So then your, your staircase goes up two increments. And then maybe you sample two or three surveys in a row and there's no new species, but then you get to the fourth one and then you get a new species and you go up again. So that's why a species accumulation curve, raw data, gives you 
this stair step look. Whereas if you um, were to repeat that over and over and over again, and you get this kind of average accumulation curve, that's what we call a rarefaction curve. There are several different things that can affect the shape of that species accumulation curve or rarefaction curve. And one of them is heterogeneity on the landscape. So here we've got an area that has patches of disturbed ground with um, at sort of maybe at different successional stages and another region where there really hasn't been any disturbance and things are sort of, um, sort of evenly mixed. Why might you expect um, um, heterogeneity on the landscape to affect the slope of one of these species accumulation curves? If, if disturbance history is patchy, why would you expect um, a higher maximum here and maybe a shallower um, initial slope? If you have a disturbance event, what kinds of organisms are the first ones to show up? in a disturbed area. You mean like plants and stuff or? Yeah, not just plants though. We talked about certain kinds of plants. Remember Mount St. Helens? There were certain kinds of plants that came in first. Survivors, what they're called. Survivors, and then Tessa, what were you gonna say? No, I was wrong. I was just going to talk about like the ones that require high sunlight. Yeah, Good. so that's what we're going for actually is, is those pioneer species, the ones that are that do well under conditions of recent disturbance. Maybe the ones that bring it, that can survive under really high light, the ones that bring their own nitrogen fixation with them. These pioneer species was the term we used. So in a recently disturbed habitat, you might have only a few species that are the pioneers. It's a subset of the broader species pool. So you might only encounter five or six species in one little area. But nearby, you have an area that maybe wasn't so disturbed that has other species, not the pioneers, but the later successional species. So as you increase your sampled area, you eventually get to this, um, you, you eventually sample all the members of the species pool but any one spot might have low diversity because it only has the pioneers. So that's why you might get a shallower initial slope. Um, we can also sometimes see that different assemblages, so different uh, guilds or um, yeah, guilds or assemblages within a community might have different species accumulation curves. So here's an example from, um, from Scotland where we've got a bird um, community and a moth community. And we can look at the species accumulation curve as you increase the sampled area for both of these kinds of organisms. And notice that the birds um, max out at a little over 200 species, whereas the moths max out at over 500. Why might you have differences um, in a local area between different um, different kinds of organisms. Maybe the like the birds uh, have like live in a smaller area than like the moss. So or never mind, that's completely wrong. No, it's not wrong. It's it, I don't well I wouldn't say it's wrong, but I would just say that maybe you've you've phrased it backwards, right? If if um, birds are broadly distributed then you wouldn't expect to find um, many similar uh, similar birds co-occurring, right? If they're using the same resources, then one's gonna outcompete the other. Whereas with moths, if you've got smaller organisms with smaller ranges, then you can have similar species in different areas and they don't outcompete because they don't interact. One's over up high on the elevation and one's down low elevation. They, they eat similar food, but they don't interact, so they don't outcompete each other. Does that make sense? You might have 
um, different slopes and different accumulations because the species pool might be bigger or smaller for different groups. There's a lot more moths than there are birds in the world. And then differences in, in how they use resources and what their range is can also affect the rate at which you encounter new species as you keep looking. When you do one of these for a whole community, you only get one curve. But when you break the community out into the different guilds and assemblages, then you can see differences for different groups of organisms. So the most important thing I want you guys to get to take away from all this is here that a species accumulation curve is raw data that gives you that stair step look whenever you're encountering new individuals and new species. And then the rarefaction curve is the smoothed out general pattern that you get from repeatedly sampling a community over and over again. And finally, that um, heterogeneity and different kinds of organisms um, can have slightly different shapes to their accumulation curves. Now that's just a general, that's kind of one community perspective where eventually you could get to all the species in a community. There's also a bigger picture. The species area relationship is what we call the bigger picture. How does the number of species relate to the area that those species occupy? And a good example of this is looking at um, herps, reptiles and amphibians in the Caribbean islands. This is uh, an example from your textbook. So we're including amphibians like frogs as well as um, reptiles like this anolis lizard. And we're talking about the Caribbean islands, the greater Antilles up here and the lesser Antilles down here. This is a plot of just a handful of islands. Notice that some of them have very small areas, little islands, and there are a few really large islands like Cuba and Hispaniola. And each of these islands has some total number of amphibians and reptiles. It can be less than 10 and it can go up to just a little over 80, I think 82 on the island of Hispaniola and a little less on Cuba. Now, this is the figure that you'll often see in textbooks, including in, in your textbook. Notice it's the same islands that I showed before, but we've changed the y-axis to be log transformed. So it goes 1, 10, 100, 1,000 instead of 10, 20, 30, 40. So that's compressed the large islands kind of together. So they look closer, the points look closer together because we have this log transformation. Same things happened here. When we log transform, what you might see is maybe an arc in this case becomes a line in this case. And that's what the little inset shows, you get an arc. So this little equation here shows the species area relationship, the number of species equals the total area times some coefficient and raised to some power. And if you log transform that, you get an equation like this, which should look to you like a linear equation, right? Y equals mx plus b. The point here is large areas have more species. And when you use a log transformation, you can get kind of a linear function and find the slope of that line and find the intercept of that line. Okay, so now we come to species abundance distributions. When you go out and sample a community, like the authors of the v et al. paper did, um, you'll encounter species and you'll find some number of individuals for those species. And then you can calculate P sub I. This doesn't, the I here should be a subscript. And I stands for index. So if there are some number of species in a community, you're gonna index through each of those species. So the first one is Andropogon gerardii. Who remembers the common name for that grass? That was one of our prairie organisms of the day. Anyone remember Andropogon? It had the inflorescence with a little turkey foot look to it. Those prayer organisms of the day are gonna be easy points on an exam or a quiz. So learn about them. The Andropogon gerardii is big blue stem. It's one that you guys saw when you were out at the sanctuary. 
So our first species is going to be Endoprogon girardii, and P sub i is going to be the proportion of species 1. So P sub 1, and it's going to be 90 divided by the total number of individuals in the community. And then you'll do the next one, uh, which will be 15 divided by the total number of individuals, and so forth all the way down. Until you get proportions for each species in the community. Now, which community has higher species richness in this case? Community one or community two? We can have everybody answer, hold up your, hold up your answer. How many vote community one has higher richness? Yeah, how many vote community two? Yeah, you're all right. Community one just has more speed. It's easy, it's quick easy to understand. Which community looks like it has higher evenness? You can vote with your hands one or two. Yeah, lots of twos, good. We can look at that graphically. Here it is graphically. Now we've ordered those species from most abundant to least abundant and we have two very different curves. This um, community one has high dominance and low evenness and community two has very high evenness. That's a very shallow slope, whereas it's um, a very kind of a steep slope or a hollow curve for community one. So you can do it with the numbers, but graphically it's quite obvious, right? So that's the useful thing about creating a rank abundance diagram. What else is easy to tell besides evenness from just looking at this curve or at this graph? The number of species. Yeah, that one's super obvious, right? 12 and 16. Okay, so Let's return to something that we already kind of talked about or, or I spoke about, but I want to hear you guys talk about it. How might you expect environmental heterogeneity to affect species richness and especially species evenness? If environmental heterogeneity means different nutrient availability and different disturbance history in different spots within a landscape or within a community, um, how, might, how might that kind of variation affect species richness and species evenness? Well, if you have less nutrients available, and I feel like there'd be, you know, maybe more competition over it, so there's, you know, less species that survive or something. Good. And if there's, if some areas are nutrient poor and other areas nutrient rich, what would you expect over in the nutrient rich areas? Uh, higher richness, species richness areas. Yeah. So if you've got a landscape that has a mixture of different kinds of nutrient availabilities, then you'd get all the species that do well in undisturbed areas with lots of nutrients. And you also get all the species that do well in recently disturbed areas where maybe all the nitrogen is washed away and, um, and maybe there's, there's extra stressors in the environment like um, too much light can be stressful for many plants. What about evenness? How might you expect heterogeneity to affect evenness in a community? And there's there's a few different ways you can answer this and still be correct. So just think about it for a moment. How could um, environmental heterogeneity affect evenness in the community? I feel like it caters to a lot of different like species. So it's able to be more even because it's not just like one certain species like ideal spot if that makes any sense. Yeah, good. Um, so there were two ways you could answer this and that was one of them and, and I'm glad to hear it. If you've got a patchy landscape where conditions are right in a different spot for any 
group of species, then over a large scale, all the species have some reasonable abundance. Nobody's rare because there's a good spot for everybody. Conversely, if you zoom in and only look at a little quadrat, maybe one square meter, and you're kind of looking smaller than the heterogeneity. And then you might only look at places where one or two species are doing well at a time. Then you'd have low evenness locally, but high evenness generally, right? Across the prairie or across the watershed, you'd have high evenness, but in one spot, maybe you'd have lower. Um, Okay, we're going to talk about species interactions and how they might affect vicious evenness. Um, we'll end there last, end there next time um, after we talk about actually calculating evenness and calculating uh, dominance um, at the start of the next class before we get into photosynthesis. So we'll go over these equations as we'll start a class with a fresh start with everybody, and then we'll transition to photosynthesis after that. Sound good? All right, see you guys next time.